everybody. Uh, my name is Ruud Derwig, I'm going to talk about Android platform optimizations. Um, I started my career at Philips, Philips Semiconductors, a CE company, uh, through some uh, semiconductor industry consolidations, ended up at uh, Synopsys. Synopsys is mostly known as a hardware company. So platform here will both mean hardware and software, but uh, I'm mostly a software engineer, so it will be a lot of software and software optimizations. Uh, yeah, one slide, I'm not going to tell a lot about uh, Synopsys as a company. You might know Synopsys uh, from their uh, EDA tooling, uh, Verilog, uh, VHDL compilers. So these are the, the languages that you actually program uh, chips in. Creating socks is also something like programming nowadays. Um, but besides those EDA toolings, uh, the EDA tools, Synopsys also is a large provider of IP blocks, semiconductor IP blocks. So those are the building blocks for creating SOCs. Um, and yeah, well, besides hardware, obviously there's a lot of software that belongs to those uh, those IP blocks. Some examples: connectivity IP, USB, USB uh, three, uh, but. Part of the portfolio is also a uh, CPU or uh, yeah, a very flexible, scalable CPU. You can also use it or optimize it as a DSP, uh, the, the ARC processor. And there, of course, a lot of software uh, is needed for. Um, outline of the talk. Uh, I'm uh, trained as an uh, architect. And architects before starting doing something, building something, always uh, talk a little bit about requirements and thinking why are we doing stuff. Uh, so that's the market and uh, value drivers uh, part. Uh, then I'll zoom in on what you can optimize in the Android platform. Uh, the how to optimize will zoom into a number of details on how we did optimize stuff. Results, conclusions, there you will find the, uh, the benchmarking numbers proving that indeed the optimizations uh, help uh, and I'll round off with uh, a couple of conclusions. So markets, well, uh, anyone here in the room that doesn't have an Android phone? Uh, I see one, two, yeah, I uh, wasn't expecting. I guess you don't have the uh, latest, uh, greatest, uh, the uh, uh, Galaxy uh, Nexus ice cream sandwich. Anyone that has a developer or an early access model? No, unfortunately, me neither. Uh, but besides those nice high end phones, uh, there's also a whole range of uh, low cost uh, and, and more affordable uh, ones. Uh, well, if you surf on some, some Chinese uh, manufacturers' websites, then you find many pictures, uh, the one on the left, you see them there, it's around a hundred dollars or so. Um, what struck me is that they all look like an iPhone. So apparently they sell uh, better if they have an iPhone uh, look. Well, Android markets mostly smartphone uh, tablets nowadays, but extending in many, many other areas. Uh, so the uh, uh, TV, set a box, multimedia, Google TV sets, you have uh, well, first product in the market. Um, and that's not where it uh, stops. Uh, there can be many, many creative products. Uh, we had the keynote uh, this morning about the uh, cloud, all devices will be connected and share stuff. Uh, I found some nice pictures of washing machines running Android. Uh, of course, your microwave oven, um, but also some more realistic uh, ones, maybe uh, some light bulbs. Well, those light bulbs will not run Android, uh, but in home automation, uh, Android can, can play an uh, interesting role, I think. So, Android is not all about the, uh, the, the high-end uh, smartphones. It can and will be very pervasive, I think. Now, for many of those products, there are two key elements that are important. Uh, mobile, so power consumption, 
And if you translate that to requirements, it basically means you want to have the optim to optimize the performance per megawatt. Uh, on the cost side, it will be optimizing performance uh, for silicon area. Um, but also on the development efficiency, so uh, the system should still be easy to program, easy to use. Um, well, these requirements lead to, to hardware software trade-offs. Uh, traditionally, uh, and I think that's how Google also started all the Android stuff, uh, they focus a bit more on the, the say, the PC model. Um, do a lot or almost everything in, uh, in software and just rely on technology, Moore's law, uh, the, the performance, uh, well, if it's not high enough today, if you not have enough uh, uh, gigahertz, then the next generation actually will be twice as powerful. Uh, you go into SMP. Um, so it's flexible, but it's not the most efficient uh, way. Well, if you would do everything in dedicated hardware, so exploit full parallelism, then the uh, uh, performance and also power would be uh, really optimal, but it's very hard to create a flexible uh, device. Um, so the, the truth will be in the middle. Uh, it's uh, the, the architectures in the SOC uh, that you uh, nowadays also see. Uh, not just a powerful uh, uh, processor, uh, but additional hardware accelerators for graphics, for video, for audio. What to optimize? The picture you see here, I'm pretty sure you all have seen many times. Um, the layers of, uh, of the Android architecture. Well, in the platform, I will be mostly talking about the, uh, the kernel and the libraries and the, uh, the runtime uh, part. Uh, so we can optimize a lot uh, there. I'll give some, uh, some examples. Another thing that many people want to optimize or want to have improved on Android is uh, boot time. Uh, I won't be talking about boot time. Uh, some other people, uh, I see Tim smiling, uh, ha have done a, a lot on that. So well, I prefer you to. Uh, a lot, not made by <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard topic. Uh, and there's uh, yeah, nice resources uh, on, on uh, boot time uh, performance on the elinux.org uh, wiki. Um, so what I will talk a little bit about is optimizing actually the, uh, the hardware, saying going to a heterogeneous uh, architecture, I think, uh, and better software developers should actually have some basic knowledge about the, the hardware that's uh, underlying, or most of you probably already have a deep knowledge. Um, first point, what you, well, uh, Android running on Linux, so optimizing Linux obviously uh, helps. I will not talk a lot about uh, this specific uh, topic. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the specific processor uh, that uh, is in the, the portfolio of, uh, of my company, um, the ARC processor. Uh, last year, a colleague of mine uh, gave a presentation on uh, his experience of porting uh, Linux to the uh, Arc architecture. Uh, past year we mostly spent a lot of time in, well, doing some optimizations. We, we uh, also did some hardware optimizations on the, the MMU, handling shared, uh, shared libraries for instance. And quite some progress uh, was made, but I'm not going to, uh, to bore you with, uh, with those parts. Um, <coughs> So a much more interesting one, if you're talking about uh, Android, is the Delvic, uh, the virtual machine, that's the core of, uh, of your Android software stack. Um, Delvic basically is just another Java virtual machine, uh, a clean room or a fresh implementation. And in a few aspects, it's uh, different from the traditional Java virtual machines. So its implementation is actually uh, register-based. Uh, most Java VMs are, are stack-based machines. Um, and it has its own uh, bytecodes. And well, later on I'll, I'll tell you uh, how that actually can be used for improving the, uh, the VM. From Google you get uh, three types of uh, virtual machine. 
Uh, the first one, uh, so called the uh, portable, is basically just a, a very portable uh, implementation. It's C based, so you just compile it uh, for your uh, specific core uh, and you have the uh, result. And it's basically a large switch statement. Uh, so for each opcode that you execute, uh, you uh, jump to a C implementation. A faster one. Uh, also known as the uh, the enter um, actually does some optimization so instead of just compiling C uh, the opcodes are uh, implemented by uh, hand coded assembly uh, handlers and the overhead of the uh, switch statement is also optimized away uh, by actually calculating from the uh, opcode uh, the address where the implementation is, so they are all uh, aligned on 64-4 uh, bytes. Um, that already helps, uh, but best performance is in not interpreting, but actually use compiled uh, code. And there's a just-in-time compiler uh, that, uh, while running applications, actually looks for the uh, hotspots in the code. Uh, then does the uh, uh, translation and uh, next time that you need that or execute that piece of code uh, you will get immediately the translated code. More details uh, later. Uh, the other uh, important aspect uh, of, of Android devices of course is audio, video, graphics, multimedia part. Um, I will be talking a bit about how to uh, use a DSP for offloading uh, some of the multimedia, focusing on the, uh, the audio. Um, you see at the left the, uh, the architecture of the media players um, in Android. Um, stay with the microphone. At the top it starts uh, with well, mostly the, uh, the, the user interface, uh, the buttons, etc. to push playlists, um, all in, uh, in the Java domain. Uh, but the actual decoding is done in uh, native code in the Linux user space by something called the media player service. Well, once decoded the content, it will be rendered. Uh, for audio, that's through something called audio flinger, and only then you go to kernel space, uh, where it can be routed to some dedicated audio device, or for instance, you can use the uh, the Alsa drivers. Zooming in on the media player, um, there's actually a collection of different players that all implement the same interface. Uh, so from an application perspective, uh, the, the interfaces are, uh, are the same. Uh, Google started with something called uh, Open Core. I think that's uh, mostly abandoned uh, by now. And they have their own player called, uh, called Stage Fright. Um, but there are alternatives. Uh, last year, uh, ELCE, I think it was, uh, ST Ericsson had a nice presentation. Uh, on using GStreamer as an alternative for uh, for stage fright. Um, talking about the details there also in a, in a minute. Um, well, what is a media player? Basically, it connects components that uh, together form a streaming graph. Uh, you see it here at the bottom. You start with a reader, you can read for fi from file or uh, get stuff from the uh, network. Uh, you have a demultiplexer splitting the audio and the video, audio sent to an audio decoder, video to the video decoder, and finally the rendering. Now, a, a general purpose CPU uh, is for most audio formats, huh? if you not go into the, uh, the uh, high-end uh, uh, HD 7.1 uh, formats, uh, a normal CPU is quite capable of, of doing all that decoding. Uh, but actually a DSP is much more efficient uh, power and uh, uh, area wise. Um, so what we did is offload the audio decoding, the stream actually goes to the uh, DSP, their decoding, maybe some post processing is uh, done and it's sent to the uh, speakers or back if you need some further processing uh, here. Um, 
One thing important to mention here is that we actually want to keep the data as much as possible on the CPU. So although, uh, say from a control perspective, uh, the flow is like this, the data is not going to cross the core boundary again here, go back and there. Uh, basically it's uh, yeah, the, the streaming the control, handing off the buffers, doing the synchronization is, is all done on the DSP. Final topic here on areas to uh, optimize, uh, graphics. Um, Android graphics is actually a quite uh, complex uh, um, set of APIs and components. Uh, on one hand you have the uh, 2D area uh, where Google uh, uses something called uh, Skia which is a uh, mostly well, fully software implementation of a 2D graphics, uh, also supporting vector graphics, etc. On the 3D side, uh, basically using uh, OpenGL. And at the start, Google did not use a lot of uh, hardware acceleration. You could use uh, the uh, uh, GPU. Um, but they have software implementation for the 2D and also for the OpenGL part. Uh, uh, OpenGL 1, not uh, OpenGL 2. Uh, Honeycomb and uh, later uh, they introduced something like uh, called render script. I won't be uh, talking about uh, that. We also did not have a lot of experience uh, there yet. Um, but that's a way to actually make the, uh, the raw performance of your GPU or, or SP hardware available in a portable way to, uh, to applications. Um, Besides uh, drawing rectangles, lines, etc., uh, another very uh, performance-intensive uh, aspect is actually the, the image and surface composition. Uh, if you have multiple applications or multiple uh, parts, they can draw in a surface and they have to be combined, video, graphics overlay, etc. Um, in Android, that's done by the surface flinger. And, uh, yeah. There are also two or multiple implementations. Uh, uh, Pixel Flinger is the software implementation uh, there, or you can use your GPU. Uh, but it's also possible to use uh, less sophisticated uh, 2D uh, hardware accelerators, software bit blitters. Uh. Sorry? Uh, Pixel Flinger is. Um, I guess it's easy to explain it as the uh, a software implementation of the OpenGL interface. So if you don't have a GPU, uh, all your 3D uh, primitives will be uh, implemented in that pixel finger. <coughs> yes, uh, but OpenGL 1, 1.x. Uh, not the uh, OpenGL 2 with all the programmable shaders, etc. Uh. So what can you optimize? Well, throw in some dedicated hardware like a GPU. Um, but actually, if you want to optimize for cost, then a GPU can be uh, a very costly uh, thing. Huh? It could be easily as, as big as your, your CPUs. Uh, so there are some alternatives. Uh, especially in the, uh, the image composition, uh, where you have to do a lot of calculations on simple, simple calculations on, uh, on every pixel. Um, you can do, uh, well, use 2D graphics accelerators or even do some, some further software optimizations in, uh, in Pixel Flinger or in, uh, in Skia. Uh, I'll give some examples later. So, Zooming into a uh, few of the optimizations that we uh, did, here's an overview of the areas that we have touched. Um, first of all, and this is actually still work in uh, progress, the, the offloading to, uh, to a DSP. Um, other area is optimizing the pixel flinger and other graphics uh, operations. Um, the Linux kernel uh, mentioned the, the work that has been done there. Also, the other runtime libraries like uh, Bionic, 
uh, you can do some specific optimizations for your CPU. If you look at those uh, libraries, you typically will find some ARM assembly codes in uh, uh, routines that are, uh, are often used. Um, I did not mention another important function of Android devices, web browsing, uh, WebKit browser. Uh, also there you can do some, uh, some CPU specific optimizations, uh, especially in the JavaScript engine, uh, that will help a lot. Uh, the other parts, like the graphic rendering, uh, go through uh, the, uh, the graphics uh, aspect. And finally, the, uh, the Delvic virtual machine. Um, I'll explain a bit what we uh, did, uh, did there. Uh, I introduced the three different types of uh, virtual machine implementations. Uh, here you see the portable one. Uh, so for an add statement, basically you do the uh, addition and store the result. Um, in the portable one, uh, if you look at the result of your C compiler, uh, then you will see that there will be a jump table uh, for implementing that switch statement, uh, which basically means that you have to uh, load the, uh, the address and jump to it. Well, in the mturp version, uh, well, you see here it's the assembly uh, routines for implementing the, uh, the add, uh, loading registers with the values of B and C, adding them and storing them. But then your next uh, opcode, uh, actually uh, the location to jump to is calculated uh, by multiplying the, uh, the opcode by 64, uh, have an uh, uh, offset to uh, the, the base of your uh, uh, implementation routines, and then simply jump uh, there. Uh, this is still two instructions, uh, and here it actually was just a single uh, instruction, but since this one uh, accesses memory, uh, it, the, the latency of it is, uh, is much longer than doing a quick calculation. So that improves stuff. Now, next stuff is actually eliminating uh, these jumps for blocks of code that are often uh, often used. I have a quick graph on uh, how this actually uh, works. Um, so when you start uh, running uh, a, a Delphic application, uh, basically it's uh, a profile uh, profiling is uh, started. So if you hit a specific uh, code location. Uh, it looks if you have been uh, there uh, many times and if you are below the threshold you just do the interpretation but if you are above the threshold um, then you actually look is there a translation for this block of code uh, if it's there you jump to the uh, pre-compiled uh, uh, translation translated block if it's not there uh, then you submit a, a request to put it in a queue uh, for creating a pre-compiled uh, uh, new translation block. Uh, the translation blocks can also be directly linked, um, but if you jump back to a piece that's not been translated, you go uh, back to, uh, to interpreter mode. Um, let me quickly go through this one. Um, as said, the, the Delvic is a register-based uh, uh, virtual machine. Um, so instead of all the uh, pushes and pops that you have in a regular Java machine, uh, you don't have them uh, here, which already is a good optimization. Um, but there's some more optimizations that you actually can do, and that we have done. Um, where we had, I think, some 20% uh, speed improvement, so that's quite significant. Um, in a stack-based VM, you can optimize the pushes and pops. If you do a push and a pop of the same uh, value, uh, yeah, it makes no sense to uh, doing that. Well, something similar you can do for all the register uh, loads uh, from, from memory for your variables. Um, so inside such a translation uh, block, we actually also optimize the use of registers uh, and keep as much as uh, possible the, 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 the variable uh, values inside registers and only uh, write them back to, to memory uh, when you switch from uh, the, uh, the stack frame or when you go back to interpreter mode. 
audio audio offloading you seen this picture earlier um, well for being able to implement this uh, obviously you have to do something here in the audio decoder and the uh, the rendering um, I have a picture showing a bit more of the details what we uh, <coughs> did uh, did there um, uh, or is we planning to do here um, on the right side here you see the uh, audio DSP you're running a uh, Artos and having a uh, streaming framework uh, so that's taking care of creating components and uh, connecting them together um, what we actually do is make uh, this uh, is, it's a synopsis proprietary media API uh, available just uh, the same through a, a remote procedure call uh, mechanism so you just do here the, the C functions and they end up at the, uh, the other side and transparently but quite efficiently um, and here uh, through some uh, wrappers they uh, connect to the, the decoders and, and renderers um, well for those wrappers uh, we actually still have to make a, uh, a choice Android Audio APIs, uh, or actually also on the, the video side, they have uh, Stage Fright has two types of interfaces: um, a say, native uh, Stage Fright codec interface. Um, you also get uh, software implementations of uh, of all uh, or a number of relevant uh, codecs. Um, and the way to connect to optimized codecs uh, is uh, through OpenMax IL. Uh, OpenMax is a standard API. It's there, been there for for quite a while, um, and it's the uh, say preferred way of, of connecting optimized uh, codecs. Um, for Audio Flinger, as mentioned, it also has a dedicated interface, but you can also hook up uh, Alsa. Um, so even though OpenMax is, uh, say, the way to, to use optimized codecs, we are actually not sure that we want to use uh, OpenMax for it. It's, it's uh, 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 yeah, it has pros and cons. It's an open standard. It's it's widely used, but it's also a standard that was uh, uh, designed by committee. Uh, it's not always the, the most efficient uh, solution. Well, on the other hand, uh, state fright. Uh, your integration will be good, uh, but the, the tricks that we want to do for keeping data local on the DSP uh, might be a bit uh, more tricky to, to implement with state fight. So we actually also looked at another uh, solution, um, GStreamer, and that's the solution we're currently uh, implementing, uh, or have mostly implemented. Um, I think earlier I already mentioned uh, that uh, there is a project uh, that actually creates a GStreamer based player uh, that then on top of that implements the APIs that the Android media server expects. Um, so what next we had to do was connect GStreamer to the uh, MSF uh, proprietary uh, APIs and here you see what we uh, did there uh, it, it's fully transparent on the host CPU so the host CPU as he just thinks I'm programming GStreamer um, when you create a component uh, and uh, that component is a component that should be running on the DSP uh, then the instance is actually created on the uh, DSP core um, and then when you create a link between uh, GStreamer elements, um, the runtime implementation actually sees where is that component running. If it's running on another core, uh, then it inserts a FIFO and a, a small source component uh, that takes care of the uh, transfer of, of control and buffers. Buffers typically are, are not copied but in, in shared memory. Um, the solution actually extends to, to multiple DSPs, uh, so also here you can have a core crossing if one codex runs on uh, one DSP and the other on a, on a different one. Um, piece of source code to show how this is solved in, uh, in GStreamer. I apologize for the, uh, the small fonts, not sure if it's readable, but I'll highlight the, uh, the, the parts here. 
But when you want to connect some GStreamer uh, pins, uh, GStreamer pads, uh, basically you look at what type of uh, connection it is. If it is uh, not a deep tunnel, deep tunnel is the, the jargon used for the local streaming on, on the DSPs. Um, that means there is a core crossing from the host CPU to the DSP. Uh, and you create uh, the, uh, the sync module and the uh, FIFO and then you connect them. Um, if it's not a, uh, or if it is a deep tunnel, then it all can be handled locally on the DSP. Um, then we check whether actually it is a core crossing, so in case of multi-DSP, uh, you still need a, a additional uh, FIFO for, for the uh, buffering between the two cores. And otherwise, all you have to do is uh, connect the pins through the MSF uh, API. So finally, a few uh, s slides on, on hardware extensions uh, that, we, uh, that we did. And again here, uh, we really try to well, optimize cost and, uh, and performance. Um, here you see the, the ARC uh, CPU. And there's two extensions here. Uh, one extension you can do uh, on the ARC uh, architecture, and that's very well supported with, with tools, etc., uh, is add new instructions. Uh, so it's quite easy to put a s small uh, piece of uh, uh, VSDL, Verilog, uh, implementing a specific uh, instructions, and uh, by that accelerating stuff. I'll give an example in the next slide. The other part is on uh, memory, memory architecture, especially on, on graphics and, uh, and video. Uh, there's a, a whole lot of uh, data that needs to be uh, transported. Um, and typically memory latencies in a, in a SOC are quite high. So that means if you uh, have a cache miss, uh, it, it will take, well, it could be up to 100 cycles or so uh, before you get that uh, data. Well, uh, one way of solving that is uh, creating a memory hierarchy uh, with uh, level 1 and level 2 caches. Uh, but also a level 2 cache actually is, is well, contains a lot of memory. Um, and what we did is uh, add a prefetch unit, uh, which basically detects a number of access patterns um, and uh, then already fetches, uh, so it predicts uh, what data you will need uh, next. And the, uh, the size of that prefetch unit is, is much smaller than an L2 cache. I like this slide. I did not make it myself, but I think it's very colorful. Uh, this is one of the special instructions that we uh, did. In the pixel flinger, um, a lot of time is spent in converting uh, between color spaces. So this is a 32-bit uh, alpha uh, RGB or BGR representation, 8 bits for all colors and 8 for uh, alpha. Um, uh, and that's transformed to an RGB uh, 565, so a 16-bit representation. Uh, basically what you need to do is uh, well, get rid of the, uh, the alpha. Uh, but also the uh, lower uh, lower bit, the least significant bits uh, of the RGB uh, values. Normally, implementing this uh, would cost you what is it? Some ten uh, in instructions for doing uh, all the uh, the shifting and uh, and masking. masking. Uh, what we did is actually add a uh, special instruction that does this in uh, in a single cycle. Um, and yeah, there's uh, some more operations that you can uh, can accelerate like that. Brings me to the results and conclusions. I'll show a couple of graphs on the uh, performance uh, gains that we uh, made. First, the Delvic virtual machine. Um, work started basically uh, last year. Project then now using gingerbreads. I guess. We quickly start with ice cream uh, sandwich when that's uh, available, um, and there's a yeah a, a, a steady uh, performance uh, increase. Uh, benchmark used here caffeine marks, uh, but it's not just the absolute performance uh, that we look at. 
also the relative one that we uh, calculate in the caffeine marks per megahertz, uh, so we normalize it for the CPU speed. Here you see uh, a more broken up uh, version of the uh, different optimizations that we did. So the portable interpreter uh, is taken here as a reference. Um, actually uh, switching to the, the MTURP, uh, well, gave a little bit of benefit, but not that much. Um, switching to the JIT compiler is where the uh, big uh, speedups uh, are. And uh, the trick that we did with the uh, uh, saving uh, registers, or actually not saving them, but keeping uh, as much as possible in, in the register set, uh, gave us another 20% of uh, performance improvement. Well, Caffeine Mark is yeah, just a benchmark. If you look at uh, Pixel Flinger uh, parts, uh, then there, yeah, it's, uh, the, the difference is actually uh, tremendous. Uh, 10, 11 times uh, speed up. The hardware extensions we did, um, uh, let me see how to explain this rough. Um, you see here the memory latency, uh, so that's the time needed for getting some uh, data uh, load stores. So if it's in the cache, you typically uh, will have a zero cycle latency, uh, but that can go up to hundreds or even more cycles in, uh, for external memory. Um, first graph says the, uh, shows the, uh, the original uh, code uh, and the next one adds the uh, uh, dedicated instructions. Um, so you see a, a significant uh, speed up uh, over there. Um, what you see then in the next graph uh, is where we use the prefetching, both for the original code and the code of the uh, extensions. And uh, well, you can obviously see it here at the uh, the red bars. Uh, it's actually quite stable uh, for the the different uh, memory latencies. So uh, whereas the original one, uh, yeah, goes up uh, if your memory latency increases. <coughs> Uh, the prefetcher uh, is actually quite good in understanding how Pixel Flinger uh, accesses the, uh, the the memory and can prefetch it and uh, minimize the impact there. Um, one slide here on the uh, kernel improvements. I, I did not explain what we have been doing uh, there. It's it's both hardware and, and software optimizations. Um, and uh, well, Alan Bench showed. Uh, quite some, uh, some extensions or some improvements uh, going up to 75% or so, for some it's, uh, it's less. Um, you could argue that yeah, maybe the starting point was not that optimal, uh, so there was a lot to, uh, to gain and uh, easy, easy optimizations. Um, but I think yeah, uh, the, the, the guy working on this did a very nice, uh, nice job here. So that brings me to my conclusions. Um, well, what I uh, hope to have shown you, well, I guess you all already knew that there's many more markets for Android than just high-end smartphones. Um, but also that there's different uh, ways of optimizing your uh, Android platform. So just relying on, uh, I don't have to optimize my software I don't have to do uh, a, a good hard hardware optimization. Uh, just next generation will be uh, faster, so uh, let's not invest in software optimizations. I think uh, that's not the, the way to go. Uh, so optimize performance per megawatt and performance per area, and use uh, uh, well heterogeneous uh, hardware accelerated multi-core type of, uh, of architectures. Um, a drawback of those architectures typically can be much increased uh, uh, complexity for programming because on a homogeneous uh, uh, SMP machine, uh, basically as a programmer you hardly notice uh, that there's uh, multi-cores and then the hardware solves it for you. Um, on the heterogeneous side you have to do a little bit more in your software infrastructure, uh, but actually you can solve many of the complexities over there. Um, and finally, well, 
shown that uh, also a relatively simple processor like uh, ARC uh, with some uh, very specific uh, hardware and software optimizations, uh, you can actually achieve a, a very uh, good and competitive uh, performance. Uh, so, let me stop here. There's some five more minutes. Uh, so let's use them for some questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.